Well, good morning, everyone. I, I really am honored to be here. Um, as Candace just told you, I came to learn about this through other arteries. Um, I do a lot of work in the Jersey Shore and the state of New Jersey um, in my practice in counseling. I do some volunteer work um, in trying to assist people with going through challenges of loss and transition, and of course in my writing work. But I had not been familiar with what was going on with this disease at all. And through other clinicians who knew of me, and then they were just, you know, that circuitous route we're all meant to be where we get, and uh, we made contact. But I was reviewing a lot of it and uh, some of the material. And I have to say, it's a, um, and even listening to the doctor give his presentation, um, it's an eye opener. It really is. And it need not be told that to you, for you are living with this in one way or another. But um, I was struck by it in many ways. And then also to listen to the pediatric statistics um, is very telling. It's very insightful for us. Um, as Candace mentioned and touched on, some of the work that I got involved with, I've been, just to give you a very brief background, I've done a lot of work in hospice care. Um, for many years, um, which many of you know, hospice is a program for terminally ill patients diagnosed with six months or less to live. I was on the side of caring for the terminally ill. What happened was I was positioned to be able to then begin to deal with people who are grieving. The program in New Jersey is such that we follow a family uh, through hospice a year after in order to be able to lend them support. I felt that there was not enough education and bereavement for, that I possessed, but also that was available to be able to assist people who were grieving. Thus, I went back, I educated myself in different parts of the United States, and also did a lot of my own research and writing to be able to help individuals navigate the area after the loss of a loved one. What had happened, however, is I had no idea how it would burgeon because the need for people going through transition and change is ongoing. No matter how we go through loss and challenge in our life, no matter how we need it, there is a requirement in order to still regain hope and try to find methods to be able to keep living and keep investing in life. When Candace mentioned um, the suicide problem that we've had on the Jersey Shore, some of you are familiar with that. I was tapped by some people that know me um, just through some various other things that I do in the, the ministerial community, if you will, and got very involved with some of the churches because some of the churches were certainly mobilizing in order to be able to meet some of the need from a spiritual standpoint. What I did not know at that time, too, was um, the need for so many people to have support for grieving families, but also for siblings, because that is a critical component in the family structure. Um, when there's a loss of, of, a, of a child and having to get the whole family dynamic involved. I think that um, at the outset, I have a few different layers of what I'm going to share with you this morning. You can extract from it what you like I'm going to take some questions and answers afterwards. Um, but what I will say at the outset is um, it takes a tremendous amount of courage to face your loss. And for you to come out into a group, even a group of people that have been part of what you've experienced in some way, it is clear that you have exercised some courage, whether or not you feel it. You have to almost separate the sense of emotion and feeling courageous versus actually engaging yourself, getting yourself here, and participating in whatever is being presented to you, whether it be on the clinical side, the psychosocial side, the emotional side. Staying engaged with people is very critical. When you are grieving, when you have trepidation about something else occurring because you have this, this cloud hanging, wondering what may happen because of this disease. So participating is your first step, and you've done that. So you've done something very advantageous for yourselves already. 
Um, what I will impart to you this morning, again, just tidbits about what I do and certainly about writing, which I think is a, is a very, very successful aspect of the grieving process, but also just talk about some of the, um, the overview about grief. But some of this will be repetitive to you because you, you've lived it out already, you understand it, and you know it firsthand. So what I'm telling you may be confirmation of the same, but it's not something new to you. And for those of you who have not experienced something as dramatic as what some have in terms of uh, a critical life loss of a person, um, life has a way of placing all of us at different times in places where we have to be able to find coping mechanisms. And whatever you hear today that you may extract and use at another <coughs> point in time, I hope that that will be advantageous to you. In reviewing some of what Candace had directed me to with regard to um, the disease itself, what struck me the most was the suddenness of it. How sudden, and even hearing the doctor's overview just now in presentation describes too that there's nothing that you can prepare for with this. There's no way of being able to say, okay, I won't do thus and so. I won't do it, I won't let my child do thus and so. This one lady, this mother that just spoke um, before the ch sessions changed, just indicated, well, what do we do? What can we do? And it just, again, underscores the point that there's a shock associated with this, a tremendous shock. And I took the word sudden, and that's going to be my springboard, just to talk about a little bit of um, each of what I do. The shock of anything puts us into a place of the unknown. It's not understanding what we have to navigate because you're already bombarded with the reality that now has become true for you and you have to be able to accept that. The position of learning about a loss to the point of acceptance is a very personal and a very different timetable, a very unique journey. And in as much as you can cluster together with people who have had a loss of any kind or a loss based on this kind of a disease, your experience will still be different. It will still be personal. Because not only are you experiencing a loss, but every time we experience a loss in life and a transition that is major, you're also living out something else in life that also was part of it. You're, we all have different personalities, we have different life experiences. We never exactly know how that's all going to come together to make sense for us in some way. So nobody's story is the same, and it's important to remember that. So some people will cope right away with the shock by going into complete proactive mode, being able to just, okay, let me understand, let me get facts, let me get figures, let me digest it, and that's going to help somebody assimilate what's happened. Other people will avoid, they will just pull back because the shock is so paralyzing, <coughs> so emotionally paralyzing, and the reality is too much to absorb. And, and where we are on that spectrum is as different as day and night. We just really don't know. But the validity of that shock is something everyone has to face because it is something that has happened. And for those that have even a glimmer of what is a potentially a diagnosis of this form, and some of the children that we looked at that are attending these camps, trying to give them the playfulness is very advantageous. But there's also that concern, what else might happen? But shock is, a, is an aspect of this, and it's real, and it's true. But it has a different way of expression for each person. The other aspect of um, the shock that is part of it, it are the unexpected adjustments that need to be made. There are certain adjustments that would have to be made now in life as a result of this. Some of that adjustment is evident in this room by you learning about this organization and being started and you becoming a participant, a supporter, one who desires to see the research advanced on the part of the clinicians that are involved. So you're making certain adjustments to accommodate your life in order not only to understand, but to prevent. Also, there are, there's decision making that's going on. These are immediate decisions and also long-term, long-range decisions. 
Um, and some of them are emotionally based and some of them are practical that need to be done in the here and now. Emotion is going to come into play in some of this decision making because of the fact that you are forced to face those emotions and sometimes maybe several months, maybe a couple of years down the road, you might have thought differently about the way you handled something. It might be prudent to forgive yourself because the emotions that take over give you allowance for certain modes of behavior, certain decision making that you may not have done in a time that you had a clearer mind. Another aspect of the suddenness and the shock of, of a loss of this kind is the dread of remembering the <coughs> details of what happened. And part and parcel with that is the dread of forgetting, which is some of the reason why people hold on to their grief, which I will get to. Uh, sometimes people don't want to get out of their pain because the pain is associated with the loss and the pain keeps me closer to the one who's no longer here. So you stay there rather than advance and move forward into a different place of life and a different place of purpose. Grief has its time, grief has its season, which is different for everybody, but after its season has concluded, there is a time to go into the next place of life. And what that place is and when that time frame is, we don't know yet. But for those who are still here, there's still reinvestment to be done. And some of the legacy that is part of those that are no longer here is how we reinvest our lives for the future, for their sake from yesterday, as well as for the tomorrows that we still are here to live in, to live out. Another aspect of the suddenness is engagement that it, it doesn't matter, it, it matters that um, when you're facing a loss, you have to engage with individuals in some capacity in order to accomplish matters at hand. Everyday living, the special needs that are required as far as services that are involved with a loss, whatever it may be, and also the new health care that's required. But there's also the engagement of being able to recognize again that you have still something to do here. You still have something to do and some, something to offer. And there's still a potential within you to give to life in general. And that's the engagement that we have to be really sensitive not to pull back from entirely. Because by pulling back from that, you're also, again, limiting your own contribution to life. And finally, again, I emphasize the need to reinvest. You're not just reinvesting for yourself, you're reinvesting for other people. And this organization would not have been formed had it not been for people who cared enough to reinvest in the lives of other people. But as it grows, because the need will grow, given especially the statistics that we heard, the need is here, it's valid. But also, it means that you can't think of yourself in isolation, that you don't have something to offer. One person can and does make a difference, but collectively, there's a certain strength in that that needs to advance forward. So that, it's a summary of the suddenness that I wanted to talk about. But I also now want to um, emphasize a little bit about grief. And again, this may be repetitive to some of you, but I think it's, it's worth hearing. Grief is normal. It is normal. It doesn't seem like it. It doesn't feel like it. And it's unwanted. It is a rigorous and arduous journey. And typically, when we go through grief of some kind, it is for difficult reasons that make it such a hard season in life. But there are all, reasons, all kinds of reasons why we grieve. We grieve things that we, are, we no longer have, things that have passed. Death of any kind is the main reason. But the kinds of ways that we need loss differ. And specifically with regard to the losses uh, due to illness or due to death that are current and that are sudden, they can throw us into a very exacerbated kind of grief because they're more complicated, because they, the endings have come so abruptly. Um, the kinds of losses that we suffer due to death are certainly through the disease that we are gathering for today. 
but also, as we've mentioned, I mean, there's suicides, there's homicides, there's anticipated deaths that are coming. Death due to elderly individuals. There's miscarriages. There's also losses due to estrangement. There's losses due to people moving into other areas and moving to new jobs, to new locations, to new houses. There's good loss that causes grief, and that is even children that go off in their normal progression, and they go off and they do the things that we all raise them to do, but, they, but that needs a change for us, and again, grief is because something is missing, and so even good change can involve some kind of sorrow. The same is true with marriages or retirement. Um, anything that forces you to look at your identity in a new way, and something that's vacuous inside of your heart, what we're facing today and what we're describing here certainly has to do with the loss of people. And the loss also in some ways of freedom. Because for those of you who have had this diagnosis and live with the uncertainty of your children may, there's the concern of can we really live as freely as we once did. Um, as the doctor was speaking also, he talks about the siblings and their concern. Can they, can they move about? Can they have the same mobility? that their sibling had who was not here any longer. It limits when we see that there's a certain alteration that's been happening, happened in a life, especially that's dramatic. It makes us sometimes question, well, can I be that free? Grief for a while is healthy, and it's advantageous, and it has its place. The kinds of emotions that we'll go through during grief, they run the gamut from, from anger and sorrow to guilt, to shame, to regret, to happiness. There's a, there's a whole spectrum. And I need not tell you that, because it, the grief that I describe is universal. But each one of us in the room, whether we've come together because of this disease or another reason, we've all suffered a goodbye of some kind. Or we will, because that's the nature of being alive as a human. None of us can escape that. But what grief does very often, and especially with dramatic losses, grief can, immo grief can immobilize people. And it can certainly put people at a standstill. And there's a sense of paralysis in some ways that you can't move on. But healthy grief does go through its own timetable. And it goes through its own process. And there is an opportunity in grief to extract growth from it and to make that growth a part of who you are now to become stronger and to become safe in a place of being able to express your sorrow and what has happened in your life, but also live with new hope for what can still be. When I wrote about grief specifically, I used the seasons of the year in order to be able to illustrate the kinds of phases we move through. And the book that I've written, this book was um, written um, a number of years ago and became popular after 9-11. Um, it sold out, it went out of print, and after Hurricane Sandy, I had gotten so many requests for it again that it was republished again, so it is available again. But it um, uses the same premise of the seasons, describing um, autumn, autumn is the time, the pivotal time of change, uh, winter is the season of the grief pattern where you have introspection and you're thinking and you're remembering. Spring is the time to open up to new beginnings again and have new hope. And then summer is the time when you're actually engaging in that hope and you have a new purpose in life. The seasons of the year are such a, um, a natural um, backdrop that everyone can identify with. But when we come to grief, we never know. So the book is certainly one that guides people whenever and however change happens. But one of the critical points that I think is useful to remember is that the, the challenges that grief presents are ones that um, can seem so normal and can seem um, valid because a loss has been so difficult and so dramatic. And certainly, that's the kind of loss that we're talking about here. But grief does not validate the kinds of behaviors or the kinds of transitions that make us become more challenged after a grief season passes. 
and specifically, um, let me say that while grief, grief is very, very uh, needful and it has its own timetable, it can also be the impetus, though, for developing habits and new ways of living that are not coping mechanisms, that can actually put people into a very more deepened state, namely addictions um, to alcohol, <coughs> to drugs, to escapism of any kind, whatever that may be. Um, getting involved with individuals and people that aren't necessarily wholesome, aren't necessarily supported for all the right reasons. But grief can be so unwanted that it makes people vulnerable, but it also makes people open enough for any kind of activity and any kind of personalities to enter in to avoid the hard hardness of going through that terrain of grief. However, when we are mindful of that and recognizing that certain aspects of your behavior and certain physiological changes, such as uh, loss of appetite, gain of appetite, sleeping too much, not sleeping enough, and those changes that are not based on any kind of, of drug, they're not based on anything over the counter or anything prescribed, they're just natural because you're going through all these oddities. When you realize all of that, but you're not developing any habits or you're not encountering ways of living that are going to be an impediment to grief, that is certainly very, very advantageous to you. But it's very important to keep in mind because some of the people that I've met over time have developed some challenging ways of life because they got stuck in a place that they, they were not recognizing some of the pitfalls of grieving. And again, the validity of a loss, when you say the kind of loss that you have, it makes it almost acceptable that I can feel this way because of what I've encountered. And yet, letting a healthy season of grief have its time also means coming out of it in a healthy way and also being stronger for it and being the witness to other people who have had to come through that as well. What we never want to do in a season of vulnerability is make ourselves more vulnerable. And you have to be really watchful of that. You have to be watchful for yourself. You have to be watchful for your spouses, your children, your grandchildren, whoever they may be. Normalcy in life and structure is very healthy and very good. It doesn't mean that you don't stop and cry sometimes. And tears are good for men and for women. It doesn't matter. They're cleansing, they're healing, and it's okay for children to see adults cry. But what it's not good to do is so avoid it that you make um, a drama or you make a, a complete um, emphasis on always being joyful that you can't let the pain in and let the darkness in. It's got to have its room to breathe too because that's a reality. And these losses help make us who we are. They define us. But a healthy season of grief is also allowing you to be honest in front of the others around you when their turn comes. Because every one of us will suffer loss of some kind. We just don't know how. And for young people, and for children, and for teens especially, and college students too, um, which I, as a, a parenthetically, I, I say here, Pay attention to your 20-year-olds and your college students. Um, sometimes we think, you know, the 18 and 21-year-olds, they're, you know, they're off on their own now, they're in school, they're fine. They need just as much groundedness. They need that steadiness, maybe even more, because uh, we send them off to college and they are being indoctrinated with all kinds of lifestyles, all kinds of family members that have a new influence on them and they need the steadiness and the structure of what they knew. They knew they need their people. They need their people, and we're still their people, even though you give them the wings that, that parents give them. But I say all of that because the, um, the importance of recognizing that you want to let grief have its time and its hour in a healthy way, but you also want to make sure that it, it has enough of its stay, but you don't create a new encumbrance for yourself once that season has passed, because that will bring a whole new host of challenges. So that's where you want to keep it in a safe place. Now, 
with regard to, um, again, using some of the um, exercises from the book, the way that the book is structured, which I was asked to talk a little bit about, is at the, e the end of each seasonal chapter, there's a group of exercises, the art therapy exercises, but primarily journaling. Um, I've been journaling since I was a young girl. Um, my parents put one of those little lock and key um, diaries in my Easter basket, along with my chocolates and everything. And um, I used it on the following morning, on Monday morning, before I went to school, I started writing in my journal. I thought it was the best thing since sliced bread, and I never stopped. I just loved it, and my parents were readers, so I was always accustomed to reading, but this was like a whole new, it wasn't just the essays that you were assigned in grammar school, this was a whole new opening. I could write whatever I wanted. You know, there was no topic that the teacher gave. I could do what I wanted. And it stayed with me. I mean, all through college, I majored in the English in college. I, I've written that business writing as well as nonfiction adult writing, and it just stayed with me. But I learned through conferences and I've learned through my own workshops that I've attended and all my study, how statistically it has proven how cathartic and therapeutic writing is. And because of the kind of writing that I give you in here for the prompts that are due to grief, what you're essentially doing is writing your own personal feelings and your own story. You're trying to digest some of what has happened to you Put it in its personal form, its personal place, and it's for your eyes only, unless you choose to share it. Journaling is a private place where you go, where you create a relationship and a bond with the paper. And you're coming to tell it certain things that maybe you don't even know until you actually get to the page and you start writing. Um, I say that the page, because I'm still a hand writer, I do a lot on the computer, but I still, I guess because it's the way that I developed my relationship with the page, my strongest work still comes out by hand. And I know that probably sounds very dated in our techno technological age, but it works for me and it's been very potent. But um, it is important to find yourself um, a journal of some sort. It can be as simple as just a notepad, it can be something fancy from Barnes and Noble, whatever you like, and just make a pattern each day of going to that. And maybe start out just with a couple of paragraphs, maybe just a few words. It may seem odd to do it, but it has a lot of value to it. And again, you need not share any of what you're writing but you know it's there. And maybe a week later, you can go back and you can see what you wrote on the first day when you actually started it, and just keep advancing. And then let the, let the spirit in you, and let your imagination and your own subconscious guide you as to how much you actually fill up. You don't even really know. Um, there are times when I know in art classes that I've taken as a, as a student, as some graduate work I did, um, we were told to take 15 minute intervals for some of the painting that we would do. And again, as a, as a writer and considering writing as artistry as well, um, I would do that with my watercolors, but then I would switch sessions and I'd do it with my writing and just for 15 minutes. I've used that for some in my own workshops that I've taught to tell people just write for 15 minutes and then put the session timer down and say I'm going to write for 15 minutes. See what comes out in 15 minutes. Sometimes, especially if you get used to the relationship of writing and begin to do it a little bit more, you'll say 15 minutes, it just seems like I just got started. But you'll be hitting something. You'll be hitting a nerve. You'll be hitting a nerve. And something's going to come out that you, did not, you are not aware of. You're going to get an insight. You're going to get some direction. You're going to get some counsel. And you're going to get some healing that you did not realize because you sat down to the page. That's how powerful it can be. Now, again, how long you do it for in terms of the length of time or the time of, in, as far as years are concerned, it's really up to each individual because you just never know. But it is a tool, like many others, that you can incorporate into your healing process and also that you can invite others in your family to do as well when they're not sure, when they're trying to question something that's going on because it is something that's readily available, it's personal, and it certainly has a lot of benefit to it. I say a word in here too about computers because we know that, especially a lot of the young people, they are on computers, and they continue to go forward and they continue to 
use a lot with their laptops, a lot of them will write on a computer. A lot of them will do that, and it's been very beneficial for them. And there's no, and in, in many ways, there is just no downside to doing it that way as long as it's done, because the same truths are going to come forth, whatever they write. Um, again, if people don't want, want it to be shared, they would want it deleted. And the same is true of any paper copies. Uh, sometimes I've had, I've, I've counseled and I've been in situations where, in my private practice, where some individuals um, are in situations where they can't leave their writing available for anyone to find because it might be incriminated. It might cause more volatile situations in a home. So I've always advised them to take it out, make sure they shred it, make sure they burn it, um, or they can save it, give it to a friend, give it someplace else where they know it's safe if they want to keep it. But the main thing is to do it, because doing it is going to make that critical difference. Um, and also, um, the other point to make as well that I think is important about journaling is that Sometimes the value of what you're going to actually learn about in the journaling process is going to benefit somebody else in your family. You could be writing about something, and you could be starting in a stream of consciousness, and you don't even realize that that's where you're going to go, and you're going to get an answer or a revelation that is going to be very beneficial to you. And what it may mean, though, it may mean that it's a nugget that is meant to be important to somebody else around you. It may be an answer for them, in which case you have an opportunity to share. So I'm going to raise to you something that I know is important and I know it's valuable. And sometimes people don't think to do it because it seems too simplistic. And that is to um, write a letter to people that you live with, or your family members. Write a letter to them expressing to them something that is revealed through your journaling, something you're feeling about them or toward them, about the situations that are going on, especially as it relates to your death in your family, or a disease, the disease you may be living with now. When you sit down and you focus and you write a letter to a person who's living in the same house or is a member of the same family and you give that to them, you are sharing your time with them, you're sharing encouragement, and you're giving something then to them that is going to be a strength for them. And part of our healing process as individuals is making ourselves stronger for the sake of other people's lives. None of us live in a vacuum. None of us do. And everyone is helping each other navigate this life in every way. And it's really important not to miss those opportunities and say, oh, I'll do it another time, or be dismissive to think, oh, how valid could it be? You never know. The other potency of letter writing is it can be saved. And it may be a year from now when somebody actually looks at it after they stuck it in a drawer, and maybe they skimmed it, but maybe after something else traumatic happens in life, they have evidence of something that was valid and something that came from somebody's heart. Um, the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What we have on the inside is what we give on the outside. When something serious and sorrowful happens to us, we can think that the heart will shut down. But it doesn't, as long as we let it heal in its proper fashion. And part of that healing is still to believe that you have something to give to somebody else. And sometimes that comes in the form of writing, which is tangible, it's something evident, it's something that can be saved, it's something that can be shared. So I think it's an important word to say. I'm going to um, finish up with a couple of comments and take some questions from you. Um, but what I want to say in um, closing that I think is very, very important is um, of the many things that I've learned about in grief in the years that I've been doing it is um, how people approach life after they go through a raw season of grief. How they actually open themselves up to it or do not open themselves up to it. And I know that um, any kind of losses that we suffer in life may require us to, to live life in a new way, in some new way. But one of the most important ingredients to living a life with hope is having gratitude. And I know that that word may seem somewhat um, disdainful even if you've suffered something. How can I be grateful for what has been? And yet, gratitude is a strength. It is a strength. 
And it's not just a gratitude for what is now. What you're actually giving thanks for is what was. And all of us have in our lives the what was. And the things that have, that have gone, that are no longer part of our lives, in the mainstream, in our everyday life. But if they were valid enough and strong enough to make us grieve, love was part of that grief. And the love still lives. It hasn't gone anywhere. But one of the ways that we express that love is by being grateful for what we have. And being grateful for having known these individuals at all, who not only we got to sow into their lives, but they also, they came and they sowed into our lives and helped make us who we are. I say in closing, before I take your questions, um, I do come from a Christian faith. Um, I was born and raised in the church, and I certainly believe in the Lord Christ. And yet, I have to tell you that it wasn't until I saw, did a lot of work in grief and went through some of my own losses in life that I realized how strong that faith would become. But there's an old parable, in the, uh, not the parable, the uh, story in the Bible that some of you would know of about the ten lepers. Um, it's a story that you hear very commonly. There were ten lepers walking along and Jesus was at a distance and he, he, the lepers saw him from a distance and they were calling out to him and they said, um, come, master, heal us, save us. And Jesus did. He turned around and he healed all ten of them. The lepers went on their way. Um, doesn't, the Bible doesn't explain entirely why, but they went on his way, their way healed now, and only one came back to say thank you. Only one. And Jesus said of that, of that person, were there not nine others? Were there not nine others? Um, and the point is, only 10%. It's a small fraction that came back, but everybody had the same lesson. Everybody got that same lesson. I say to you that um, if you can come back and you can say thank you for what you have, the people, the person, the photographs you still have, if you can say thank you for what the person meant to you, and you have that in your heart, you're going to be in a position of strength to be able to help other people say thank you and put your arm around them when they need it. Because people are going to need all of you, they're going to need your witness, they're going to need your strength, because they're going to go through things that your situation right now is preparing them to receive strength from. So I leave you with the hope, the hope that while you've suffered something very, very serious, and you live with things that are very real and dramatic, you care, because if you didn't care, you wouldn't be here. So may you go forward with a sense of gratitude, and may today, not through my own, only my words, but everyone that has spoken to you, may you go forth with a measure of hope that you can read best in your lives and the legacy of those you love. Thank you. journaling or about grief, whatever I can answer for you, I'd be glad to. Christine, I don't even know what to say. I mean, you just said it so well. You said everything so incredibly. I didn't experience the loss that all these parents have and my loved ones, but I experienced the loss of help. I experienced the loss of, of uh, my life being what it was. Yes. You know, and it's a small thing comparatively. It is. I I know that, mm -hmm. but um, but I really appreciate it. I appreciate the words. Uh, you, you do have your books available, correct? Yes, there are some books for sale on the um, on the table there. They're fifteen dollars each, and all the proceeds go to efforts in suicide prevention. Um, what's the uh, book that you were referencing? The that's the that's the book that's on oh, that's the you wrote that book. Dubai. Yes, I wrote that book. Yes, and there's some cards up there and information. So and I'll be staying for a few minutes. If anybody wants to question me on the side, I'll be glad to, to question, to answer any questions.
Thank you very much, Christine. You're very welcome. All right, um, we're going to do a quick break for lunch, and we're going to let everyone go and grab their lunch, and then um, we're going to invite Dr. Cooper and Dr. Price back to answer any questions you guys still might have for them, and we'll also do a short little award ceremony for a couple of the families here in attendance today. So go ahead, grab some food, and then we'll come back and do some questions.